The pass was quite grimy, and people resorted to unusual practices for hygiene. You might be shocked by the strange alternatives to soap they used, though it's worth noting that soap itself is quite ancient. Evidence suggests that as far back as 2800 BC, the ancient Babylonians had their own soap recipes. But as with many things, ideas about health and cleanliness have evolved over time. Let's take a look at how royalty managed their hygiene throughout history. Clean Egyptians. Ancient Egypt was remarkably advanced in many areas, including hygiene. It's no surprise that the builders of the pyramids also prioritized cleanliness. For Egyptians, cleanliness was closely tied to spirituality and the afterlife. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, from the New Kingdom period, includes spells and rituals essential for navigating the afterlife, with a strong focus on being clean and presentable. Without this cleanliness, the deceased couldn't properly perform certain spells, akin to having a magical charm for protection. Unlike Hogwarts, where hygiene details are vague, Egyptians saw cleanliness as a purification ritual before meeting the gods. They took daily baths in the Nile and used a variety of cosmetics and fragrances. Cinnamon oils and ointments were used to combat body odor and protect against the harsh sun. Pharaohs had elaborate hygiene routines, Pharaoh Ramses III bathed in perfume water daily and had attendants for his cosmetics. Cleopatra famously bathed in donkey milk for smooth skin and even had her ship sails perfumed for a fragrant journey. Building Baths In ancient China, bathhouses were highly popular across various dynasties. Marco Polo, during his visit to the Southern Song dynasty in the 13th century, noted over 3,000 bathhouses in the capital, Kensei. Centuries later, during the 18th century, Emperor Qianlong of the Qing dynasty took this to a new level. Obsessed with cleanliness, he initiated numerous public health measures. Qianlong recognized the link between hygiene and disease prevention, leading him to construct an extensive network of public baths and toilets across China. He also implemented regulations to enhance cleanliness, including laws for regular street and home cleaning. Known for his personal hygiene, Qianlong bathed multiple times a day and changed clothes frequently. His personal spaces were maintained by attendants who ensured constant access to clean water. He combined his passion for hygiene with art, commissioning works that promoted cleanliness and sponsoring educational materials on good hygiene practices. Before Qianlong's reforms, the Forbidden City, with nearly 1,000 buildings, lacked modern sanitation. The royals used rudimentary clothes stools, which were simple boxes with holes, and waste was masked with perfume and removed by maids. Concerned for his sick mother, Qianlong had three toilets built adjacent to the palace complex, featuring flushing systems and copper pipes for clean water. Although these improvements were significant, with up to 100,000 people living in the Forbidden City at times, three toilets were still insufficient. Don't mess with the Great Khan's water. The Mongols may have valued water even more than Cyrus the Great. Genghis Khan, in particular, was a water enthusiast, frequently bathing in hot springs and enforcing strict rules about its use. He understood that water was a precious resource that needed protection. In Mongol culture, they would rinse their mouths before washing their hair to clean the water and prevent illness. The strictest rule was that anyone who contaminated the water source by touching their face would be killed. This harsh policy likely helped prevent contamination. The Mongols were skilled at locating and utilizing water sources, constructing wells, irrigation systems, bridges, and boats for their settlements and military campaigns. Their expertise in water management contributed to their conquest of Asia and the Middle East, establishing the largest contiguous land empire in history. However, gout was a significant issue for the Mongols. This form of arthritis, often affecting the toes and leading to severe infections, could be deadly if untreated. Kublai Khan, founder of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, reportedly suffered from severe gout. A bizarre remedy involved sticking one's foot into the chest of a dead horse or cow, believed to draw out toxins. More conventional treatments included herbs like safflower for circulation and angelica root for its anti-inflammatory properties. The Roman Urine Tax If you need to use the bathroom, now might be a good time. Just avoid using it for brushing your teeth. It might sound strange, but in ancient Rome, urine was used as a mouthwash. Urine was highly valued and had many uses, as a cleaning agent, a textile bleach, a medicine, and even as mouthwash. During Emperor Nero and Vespasian's reign, a tax was imposed on urine collection and sale, giving rise to the phrase, pecunia non olet, or, money doesn't stink. Under Emperor Vespasian, AD 69-79, 
public urinals were set up to prevent street urination. These urinals channeled urine into tanks, where it was sold to tanners and craftsmen. Urine was prized for leather softening and teeth whitening. Although it might seem unappealing today, this practice was common in ancient Rome. The Portuguese urine, in particular, was highly sought after due to the belief that their wine quality enhanced the urine. This was because wine consumption increased uric acid in urine, making it a better dye and teeth whitener. The demand for Portuguese urine led to a flourishing trade with Rome. This use of urine continued into the Middle Ages until synthetic chemicals eventually replaced it in the 19th century. Wine Baths Jesus turned water into wine, but Mary Queen of Scots took it a step further, she bathed in it. As a devout Catholic, the significance of Christ's blood took on new meaning for her. Living in a bloody era, her end was also violent. We could have a drinking contest, Bloody Mary, a glass of wine, or a whole tub of wine with a Bloody Mary floating inside. Ugh, I just got a bit queasy. Anyway, Mary was Queen of Scotland during and after Henry VII's reign. When Elizabeth I, Henry's daughter, came to power, Mary was at the center of plots to replace Elizabeth due to her Protestant views, which many Catholics opposed. Imprisoned for these schemes, Mary had plenty of time to relax, so she turned to bathing in wine. While the exact frequency is debated, modern practices like venotherapy use wine for skin treatments. Wine's antioxidants, like resveratrol, are believed to boost skin health and combat damage from free radicals. The acids in wine can also exfoliate and brighten the skin. So, if you're into historical skin treatments, Mary's wine baths might have had their perks, though they didn't save her from execution for treason. The world's first dentist. Ever wondered about the stunning dental care of Egyptian pharaohs? In ancient Egypt, dentistry was remarkably advanced, with skilled dentists ensuring the royal's teeth remained pristine. One notable figure, Hesiare, or Hesiare, is believed to be the world's first dentist. Hesiare, a prominent official, served as both physician and dentist to Pharaoh Djoser of the Third Dynasty around 2600 BC. Hesiare's tomb in Saqqara contains a number of inscriptions that provide insight into his work as a dentist, including his use of various tools like dental drills and forceps. The ancient Egyptians had a pretty deep understanding of dental anatomy and were skilled at treating a whole range of dental problems, including cavities, abscesses, and gum disease. They had various techniques and materials for treating teeth, including gold and ivory that were used to make fillings and crowns. They also used herbs and other natural remedies to alleviate pain and treat dental problems. Thank you for watching Just Discovery. Remember to like and subscribe to keep uncovering the world's greatest mysteries and beyond. Your support and engagement help more people discover these videos.